This is chapter four. I want to continue in this chapter this morning. As always, thank you for joining me. Let's, let's begin in verse 12. Galatians chapter four. Let's begin reading at verse 12. It says, I beg of you, brethren, become, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You've done me no wrong, but you know that it was because of bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you do not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. So I have become your enemy by telling you the truth. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. It is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, not only when I am present with you, my children with whom I am, I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed by, about you. Uh, tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman and one by the free woman. Uh, but the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, is children of promise. But as at that time he was... He who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. So it is now also. But what does, this, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. And Paul begins our reading this morning really uh, on a personal note as he recalls and really brings to their mind how they had received him. In spite of his physical infirmity, they received him. And not just in any old reception. As Paul says as if he was an angel from God or even Jesus himself. In, in verse 15, Paul says, Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I testify about you that if possible, you would have torn out your eyes and, and given them to me. You know, obviously, th this speaks to the personal relationship that Paul had with these brethren. They had great respect for him, obviously, as an apostle. Uh, of Jesus Christ. They received him. They received his message. And obviously, um, as we know, Paul had great affection for them. They had great affection for him. You know, I, I love the fact that, that Paul was never shy about his relationship with his brethren. I, I love that about Paul. We're going to see that as we read uh, through the Pauline epistles. He, he, he never, it seems to me, struggled to articulate how he felt uh, about his brethren and how in turn, how it made him feel when they uh, we're affectionate towards him. And I'll just say this. I think we need more of that. I think we need to express our love for one another more regularly. I, I think we need to be old, more open about our affection for one another. Um, that's just my two cents. But, but I, I love that about Paul. When we get to verse 16, he says, So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? You know, brethren, I, I think all of us at, at one point or another have probably been guilty of um, withholding the truth with someone because we just – selfishly, we didn't want to deal with the repercussions of how they may treat us in return. It's not easy sometimes to tell people the truth. And listen, sometimes it's hard to hear, is it not? Because oftentimes the, the truth, we're just not ready to hear it. We're not ready to change. We're not ready to accept it. So we, we do all sorts of things to try to ignore or, or shift in, in an effort to really just get around the truth to ignore it. Uh, sometimes, as opposed to just listening to the truth, we, we discount the messenger, right? We slander the messenger. As opposed to it being about the message, assuming it's truth, we attack the messenger. You know, the problem with that strategy, while it may make us feel good um, in the short term, regardless of how we feel about the truth in the moment, assuming that they're telling us the truth, the messenger, possibly with all their flaws, as all human have flaws, um, if they're telling us the truth, the truth doesn't change regardless of who the messenger is. And here's the deal. You've probably, like me, been on both ends of this. And when you tell someone the truth, sometimes they make you their enemy. But it doesn't change the truth. You know, obviously, Paul, he didn't see, I don't think, this type of reaction coming. I think Paul anticipated that these brethren would continue in, in the truth. If you go over to verse 17, Paul describes the false teachers who were distorting the gospel. He would say they eagerly seek you, but not in a commendable way but they want to shut you out 
this is so key, listen to this, so that you will seek them. You know, I, I think this truth is hard to accept sometimes. And, and I don't think Paul says this flippantly or lightly. Obviously, he's led by the Holy Spirit. These false teachers that were promoting a, a distorted gospel, um, it wasn't about the brethren. It wasn't about God. It wasn't about truth. This wasn't about these false teachers acting in these brethren's best interest. I want you to look at that last part of that verse again. It says that they want to shut you out, but notice the why, so that you will seek them. Brethren, that's not what we're about. We're not about attracting people to us. We're about attracting people to Christ. This was about them, their glory. They're not concerned about you following the truth or following God. Their concern is causing you to follow them. It's about them. And I was, have you ever known anyone like this? Um, you know, not long into dealing with certain people, I, I think it's been my experience. It, it can become rather obvious that this isn't about God's glory, but instead theirs. And brethren, we need to be aware of this. We, we need to really listen to what is being taught. We need to always measure it with God's word. And if it's not truth, we need to reject it. But let's understand there are people like this. And we need to be aware of it. It's selfishness is ultimately what we're, we're dealing with here. You know, you, you can tell. This is, this is breaking Paul's heart. He, he could not have been um, more opposite with these brethren than these false teachers were being. He says in verse 20, for I'm at a loss um, about you. He just can't believe it that, that, that this is where we're at. In verse 21, Paul, in, in a most direct way, says, tell me, you who want to be under law, do you listen to the law? <laughs> you, you say you want to be under law, or at least your, your, your actions right now, um, the acceptance of this distorted gospel, it's indicative of the fact that, um, that you certainly are claiming to, to, at the very least, go back into elements of the law. Um, Paul says, are you listening to the law? Do you, do you really know what you're going back into? You know, beginning in verse 22, Paul refers them back to the law, you know, or back to the scripture, I should say. These Jews, over and over, they, they pride themselves in name dropping, essentially, when it comes to Abraham. They, they claim to be children of Abraham. Um, maybe they were, but not in the way <laughs> that they thought. You know, Paul reminds them how Abraham had two sons, um, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. And before we get into this allegory, I think it's good for us to be reminded that, that many events that we read about in our Old Testaments, they prefigured or shadowed New Testament teachings that, that ultimately, I think, are intended to remind us, certainly, the cohesive nature um, of the Word of God, the, just the, the whole harmonious way in which it's written, proving that it's, um, essentially that it's from the mind of God, but teaching us ultimately, reminding us about the omniscience um, of God. You know, we, we see this certainly in the concept of man's salvation through water. When you think about Noah's salvation through water, it's, it's a type of our salvation today, as we can read about in 1 Peter 3, um, at verse 20 and 21. We see this certainly in, in the Mosaic Law, um, as it was filled with shadows uh, of the law uh, of Christ, as we can read about in, in the book of Hebrews, and all the elements for shadowing in, in the tabernacle. We, we see it when Abraham. Um, when he was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar in Genesis 22, certainly prefiguring a type of um, our Lord's sacrifice. Uh, so Paul, he, he, he presents this allegory that's easy to see as he continues to really prosecute the case that, that true freedom from sin is only found in Christ, um, not returning to a law that was never intended to save one. So, so you remember Abraham's first son, his name was Ishmael, not born from his wife, Sarah, but instead his wife's servant. And, and you remember in a lapse of patience, a lapse in faith, they, they hatched this scheme to have a child basically through a surrogate, uh, Sarah's servant, um, Hagar. Listen to Paul, the contrast that, that Paul makes in, in verse 22, back in our text, Galatians 4, verse 22, it says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and one by the free woman. Uh, but the son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the, the free woman through the promise. Now, you remember Ishmael came from Hagar, a, a slave woman, um, the son uh, of this servant, this slave. He was born according to the flesh. Um, he was a result of, of a human scheme on, the behalf, on behalf of, of Abraham and Sarah through human action. Abraham and Sarah went outside of God's plan, and they did what they thought was best. This was hatched in the flesh. 
you know, keep in mind that the Jews prided themselves, as we said a moment ago, in their physical ancestry as they, um, that would connect them to Abraham. Their connection to Abraham was physical, though, not spiritual. On the other hand, Isaac, he's born of a free woman. He was God's plan, um, born through promise, uh, part of God's plan. Abraham, in this case, acting in faith. Isaac was born through the promise. It came about as a result of divine intervention. The purpose of this birth would be through Isaac that God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 that all nations would be blessed through, through Abraham's seed, through Isaac, obviously uh, referencing Christ. So, so what's the point of all this? You know, verse 24 tells us that the two women and the children that came from them, they represented the two covenants. Uh, the servant Hagar, Hagar, she represents the law of Moses, the first covenant, which produced children, it says, in slavery, ultimately in need of a savior, a redeemer. Sarah, the, the free woman, on the other hand, she represents spiritual Jerusalem. She represents the law of Christ, the new uh, covenant. You know, Paul, he contrasts this idea of present Jerusalem represented in Hagar, her children, slaves under the law of Moses, no hope, no freedom, no forgiveness. And Jerusalem uh, above, this represented in Sarah and her children, those who are free from sin through the law of Christ. Now, now look at verse 24, Galatians chapter 4. It says, this is speaking allegorically, for these women are two covenants, one coming from Mount Sinai, giving birth to all children, or to giving birth to children, I should say, who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is enslaved with her children. But Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, Paul says, for it is written, rejoice in fertile one. You do not, you who do, do not give birth, uh, break forth and shout to you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one are more numerous than those of the one who has a husband. Over in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23, Paul would say, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Same idea. So when you put all of this together, Hagar and Ishmael, they represent bondage under the law of Moses. Sarah and Isaac, they represent freedom uh, through Christ. Now, back in verse 27, Paul quotes here from Isaiah 54, verse 1, where Isaiah prophesied of the coming kingdom, the church, and that it would consist of people saved from their sins in contrast to those who were without hope under the law of Moses. This was a prophecy of hope to a people who had been conquered by the Assyrians. They needed hope, and they're getting it. Sarah, she was born for the first 90, she was barren, I should say, for the first 90 years of her life. But her time of rejoicing came. And she had Isaac. Sarah, in this allegory, she represents hope, but Hagar, just the opposite. And verse 28 says, And you, brothers and sisters like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at the time the son who was born according to the flesh persecuted the one who was born according to the spirit, so it is even now. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not children of a slave woman, but of a free woman. You know, all of this really comes down to a simple choice, brethren. We're, we're, we're going to continue this conversation tomorrow, but here's the deal. We're either going to choose slavery um, or Christ. That Christ offers hope, a Christ that offers forgiveness, a freedom from sin, a slavery, whether it be a return to the law that was never intended to save us. That was certainly these people's dilemma. I don't think it's necessarily ours, but the same principles remain, the same choice remain for us. Do we continue with Christ, serving him, following him, living for him, putting our faith in him? Or do we return to the things of this world? Idolatry, worldliness, the, the burden, the, the slavery of sin. You know, as Joshua would say, for me and my house, <laughs> we're going to serve the Lord, right? The choice is clear. We choose Christ where all spiritual blessings are found. Did you go back and read Ephesians chapter one? Do that if you haven't. Choose Christ. I want you to look briefly at, at the next chapter, just the first verse. In Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 1, and this will set us up for tomorrow. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Let's pick up there tomorrow. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Father, thank you for another day that well, we can spend some time together in your word as we begin a new day. Father, we we understand, Father, just how blessed we are in Christ, that all spiritual blessings um, are found in Christ. And Father, we pray for those who 
have never accepted your son on his terms, never been baptized into Christ where all these spiritual blessings are found. Father, we, we pray for opportunities to, to tell them about your plan for them, to tell them about your love, your mercy, your grace, your son who died on the cross for our sins. Uh, Father, we ask that you would be with those today who are hurting, Father, those who are struggling in one form or another, whether it be just in quarantine, whether it be just as a result of the loneliness of the isolation of this virus, or Father, those who are, are literally dealing with the virus, continue to be with the Green family, be with uh, our brother Zach, Father, that your will heal them quickly, be with our sister Janice Brown, um, that she'd be able to come home, if not already, that, that things would go well uh, with her. Father, be with Ellie. Father, be with all of those who are in need of your help. Father, bless your congregation at Kenwood. Father, we recognize that as a result of this virus, we uh, were forced into the parking lot so that we can all worship together. And Father, we're thankful for that. But we also understand that as the weather is, is rough this time of year, that it presents a challenge and it's easy to become discouraged. But Father, help us to see that, that you are in charge. And help us to see, Father, what a great blessing it is to just to be able to come together in that manner to worship the God who has blessed us so richly. Help us to be content. Help us to be thankful, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.